Me gustaría hablar en español unos minutos para huéspedes estimadas de México, pero estoy seguro que es más fácil me entiende en inglés. Entonces, hay solamente pocos minutos de hablando español con permiso. Uh, me alegra estar aquí para este tema muy importante, los, las fronteras. Uh, yo soy la moderadora, yo soy profesora de derechos aquí en la Facultad de Derechos. También soy profesora de historia en la Universidad de Emory. Uh, por este programa es mejor que yo hablo en inglés. Uh, gracias otra vez uh, por su atención. Welcome to panel five, Impacts of Border Violence. We are very fortunate to have this array of distinguished speakers here with us today. Rather than introduce all of our speakers now, I will introduce each speaker immediately before his or her presentation. My introductions are abbreviated, so please see the complete biographies that you will find in your program. Each speaker has 15 minutes so that we can reserve some time for discussion and I'll be the timekeeper. Uh, we will also proceed in the order listed on your programs with the exception of the first two speakers. Our first speaker is uh, Miguel Diaz Barriga, professor of anthropology at the University of Texas Pan American, who specializes in border culture, Chicano studies, and social movements in Latin America. He is currently engaged in National Science Foundation research with Professor, professor Dorsey, who will follow um, on the construction of the border wall of South Texas. Uh, he is the incoming president of the Association of Latino and Latina Anthropologists. The title of his presentation is Necro Citizenship Enacted, Border Violence in Mexico and the United States. I wanted to uh, thank Alex Barney for the kind invitation, as well as the uh, Institute for Developing Nations for sponsoring this. And I want to give a special thank you to Mary Ward, yeah. who was extremely patient with me and I'm sure with all of us. I'm gonna sp uh, talk specifically about the border wall in the context of border violence, uh, the US-Mexico border wall. In 1989, the Berlin Wall fell and people talked about a world without walls. That prediction turned out not to be true, and in the 1990s and 2000s, we saw the proliferation of what we call the new walls around the world, including in Israel, Spanish ex exclaves in Morocco, uh, Saudi Arabia with Yemen, etc. The list goes on, and now we have the U.S.-Mexico border wall. In thinking about these walls, uh, Margaret Dorsey and I have come up with the term, or arrived to the term, necro-citizenship to define the politics of these walls. And basically what we're thinking about is these walls act as sites of military engagement, uh, as means to prevent illegal immigration and drug smuggling. They in fact signal that they are a space where exclusion and death are possible. Now, in the context of Israel, that probably makes a lot of sense. And when we look at the Spanish exclaves in Morocco, that also makes a lot of sense. Uh, the wall in South Africa with Zimbabwe uh, is electrified. And there have been many deaths on that wall as well. Thinking about the US-Mexico border wall as a site for the enactment of necro-citizenship perhaps seems a little heavy-handed, but one way to think about this perhaps is that in the last 15 years, about 5,000 migrants have died in the desert areas uh, in the southwestern United States. Border Patrol defines and discusses informally the border wall as a funnel meant to drive undocumented migrants into these desert areas. Even the Government Accountability Office argues that border, the Border Patrol now has a policy aimed at creating deaths among migrants. So that's one way to think about this border wall in this larger context of walls around the world. So let me uh, just start with two slides that show the outcome of this logic. This first slide relates number of uh, drug deaths in Mexico with miles of border fencing. 
This uh, slide was put together by a group called American Border Patrol, which includes uh, ex-Border Patrol agents and ex-U.S. military uh, as members. And basically what they're arguing here is that the border wall is effective. And one way that to show its effectiveness is that as it, incre it has increased chaos among the drug cartels in Mexico and led to an increase in deaths. Now, being a social scientist, I have a little trouble with that logic, as well as seeing this chart expressing any sort of causal relationships. But I do have to sort of take this view of cultural relativity to try and understand the logic that informs this way of thinking. And I come to the conclusion that you only can sort of see this logic as an expression of necrocitizenship. The wall has created death and chaos. That's what it's meant to do. It is effective. My second slide is a group of Tea Party activists at the border wall. And I'm, I'm glad they're decorating the wall. It's very ugly, so at least that's one good thing. I'm not sure I like, you know, the decorating scheme probably could be a little more complex. Um, at this rally, Sheriff Joe Arpaio spoke, the uh, controversial sheriff who does all the migrant sweeps in uh, Phoenix, in Arizona. And he said that the, prob the problems of uh, illegal immigration and drug smuggling could be solved very easily if the U.S. government would allow the Border Patrol to go into Mexico and arrest immigrants and smugglers before they cross the border. Well, from a legal perspective, I think there's probably a couple problems with this logic. One's the small issue of Mexican sovereign, sovereignty, which, you know, probably should be considered. And the second, of course, is how do you define intent? Is someone just standing on the other side of the border looking towards the United States intending to cross and therefore should be arrested? So again, we have to go back on what is the logic of this. And one of the things that we need to look at in the context of the construction of the border wall is a kind of lawless law. And by that, I mean with the construction of the wall, with the development of different enforcement measures, we've seen the waiving of numerous federal laws. The construction of the border wall itself involved the DHS waiving 36 laws, including environmental regulations, uh, cultural regulations, etc. So the fact that the sheriff could go up and basically disregard, say we can do this by disregarding the law, really follows an increasing logic of the way we treat the border. Okay, it would be a big mistake to write off these attitudes as being sort of fringe elements. Uh, poll after poll shows that uh, the U.S. population is increasingly uh, supportive of increased border enforcement, uh, predator drones, National Guard troops, uh, etc. And so I think we could start to talk about the normalization of militarization on the U.S.-Mexico border. What I want to do in this presentation is briefly talk about how this normalization works within the popular imaginary of, our, of the United States. And I want to do that through an exploration of how the border wall and the border are represented in the national media. Uh, mainly, uh, in, in this page, paper I'll focus on Time Magazine and National Geographic. And again, my target is to understand how this overall logic of necrocitizenship is becoming increasingly uh, uh, diffused throughout our popular culture. Okay, so first of all, let me talk about the politics of doing this research. Uh, Margaret and I were taking photographs of the border wall and as usually happens, a border patrol agent came and chased us away. Um, there's no clarity about what rights one has when approaching the border wall, taking photographs of the wall. And I'd like to point out this area here where the, if you can see the border patrol uh, vehicle heading towards us, this is about roughly a mile and a half from the international boundary, the Rio Grande River. And no one is quite sure what the status is of that land between the border wall and the international boundary. It's sort of become a no person's land. 
And different times when crossing over into this area, we've had different sort of discussions with Border Patrol agents and have heard different sort of accounts about whether or not we could be there <coughs> or not, okay? And so that gets back to this idea of this sort of lawless law, if you will. Uh, next, within the popular media at least, uh, the border and the border wall are usually located in, the, in a desolate area showing the border as lifeless, okay? Now in this, this photograph, uh, which is taken from the Mexican side, uh, looking into the U.S., uh, there's a cross uh, commemorating all the migrant deaths uh, that have occurred. Uh, within, the, within the sort of popular imaginary, th these deaths are rarely mentioned. And I've been tracking stories in NPR and other areas. Uh, and oftentimes what you'll hear in this reporting is, if you hear about migrant deaths, is the fact that we are paying money to have these bodies put in morgues or shipped back to Mexico, but it's costing the taxpayer uh, money. So it becomes a very economic, uh, economically driven conversation rather than about human rights. Most photography or most imagery of the uh, border fence and the U.S.-Mexico border focus on what we call rust and dust. Again, lifeless zones. This is Nogales, Arizona. And they have a tendency to take on the perspective of the border patrol. And in many cases, we find kind of the same uh, news practices of covering, say, the Iraq War with the embedded reporter, okay? And here the photographers and the journalists will travel with the Border Patrol and actually then sort of take on their perspective as they write their article. Now this is, this is, a, this is from the, a Time Magazine report, uh, series on the border wall and border security. And one of the interesting things about this uh, photograph is the way it gives this particular Border Patrol agent a biography. Okay, it makes him a person. Now, in contrast, when you look at uh, any, any sort of representations of the migrants, they are never given any kind of biography. They are nameless for the most part, many times faceless. So we have no idea who these individuals are, what was, was it their story? Were they migrating because of poverty in their village? What kind of activities were they engaged in? So it becomes very difficult in a way, I think, to gauge. You have this sort of sympathetic view of the border patrol agent. Well, what's going on with these migrants? There's sort of a, a, a mob, if you will, or a mass. The, in this, uh, this particular slide called uh, Deployed, and again, this is from Time Magazine. Um, it looks like it could be just about anywhere, Afghanistan, uh, et cetera. Um, we see this tendency to, to in, in many ways, glorify the presence of military might on the border. Okay, now let me make one thing clear when I, when I, when I, when I sort of raise this as a critique. When you talk to local law enforcement on the border, they do not want, for the most part, increased militarization. They want to rely on more traditional law enforcement methods, and they feel that they've been successful in keeping the border area on the United States side relatively safe. So this is not an argument about uh, law enforcement or not, this is an argument about what's going on with this increasing militarization of the border. Okay. This is National Geographic. Um, again, an empty, desolate space. In one photograph, they call it a moonscape, the U.S.-Mexico border, a moonscape. Very rarely will you even see people or communities in these photographs. And for those of us who study the border, we know it's an incredibly diverse area, okay? And another good example of this desolation in Moonscape, this is a beautiful uh, photograph from uh, Time Magazine. Okay, I wanna change gears now and talk about 
talk briefly. Two minutes, okay. Talk briefly about our own attempts to sort of reimagine the border. First of all, um, and here we have a slide of the border fence being constructed in South Texas. First of all, you rarely see raised the ecological impacts of the border wall. And first of all, the actual building, this was a green space turned brown by the actual construction of the wall. And also that a group of nature preserves in South Texas are now south of the wall. Audubon had to close its own uh, a nature conservancy because people could no longer access it because of the construction of the border wall. Nature Conservancy also has a uh, uh, reserve area that had to close because of the construction of the border wall. And all these were along the Rio Grande River. The wall is north of these ecological preserves. Secondly, there are towns uh, with long histories. Many people in towns such as Gran Heno have seeing their, shall we say, their environment impacted by the federal government negatively in terms of the building of uh, levees, parks, and now the border wall cutting off access uh, to the Rio Grande River for them. That area that I showed you earlier where the border patrol agent was driving towards us was an area where people would ride their horses or, or play soccer in, and that area is, is an area now that they could no longer enter. This is the border wall going up behind a house in Gran Heno. Uh, the original plan for the construction of the border wall called for demolishing the, this town and running the wall right through it. Now, this, uh, in, in speaking to a group of lawyers here, might be an interesting question. This is what the wall looks like behind this town. It's an 18-foot drop, and I kind of, I've always wondered to allow to myself what will happen if someone falls off this wall because <laughs> it's literally in the backyards of people's houses. All right, and now just to, to end on a couple of quick notes. One of the issues that we're looking at when we talk about militarization is not only the presence of a more highly, you, you know, sort of trained border patrol that's better armed, but also National Guard troops, predator drones, et cetera, but also on the flip side, the militarization of the culture itself. And in here, we, uh, Margaret and I uh, participated in what was called Gran Heno Friendship Day, in which they had a parade. And the parade was led by sort of veterans from the town. South Texas has an incredibly high rate of participation in the military. Um, border patrol, vehicles, law enforcement, etc. That was the gist of the parade, and then there were mariachi groups, uh, Mexican folklore groups, etc. So we had this beautiful melding, if you will, sort of speaking in a kind of weird aesthetics, of Mexican-American culture and military culture coming together, and that's been something we've seen increasingly over the years. This gentleman, by the way, in this Jeep was one of the major opponents of the border wall. So he's a, he's a veteran of the Vietnam War, and he uh, uh, he was also a, a, a customs agent for, uh, to believe, about 30 years. I want to end on this slide. Um, this wall was put up by uh, Border Patrol as a means of recruiting uh, citizens. And uh, it's about 250 yards from the actual border wall. And so here you see a group of um, young girls uh, dressed in their Mexican folkloric outfits. In the background, you see members of the junior ROTC. These are high school students who are in, in the ROTC. Um, so they're being recruited by Border Patrol. And so when I asked Border Patrol, well, wasn't it ironic that they had this climbing wall so close to the actual border wall? Uh, the two agents kind of looked at me with this very dry expression, which they're very good at. And, and said, sir, the border wall does not have handles. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. Our next speaker is uh, Margaret Dorsey. She's sitting to my immediate right. She is assistant professor of anthropology and curator of the Rio Grande Folklore Archive at the University of Texas Pan American. She 
She is the author of a book titled Pachangas, Borderlands Music, U.S. Politics, and Transnational Marketing. We're very sorry for creating any hazards as you were. I think we're too close to All right. Um, <laughs> her topic is uh, depoliticizing the security machine, social and cultural impacts of border violence. Professor Dorsey. Um, there's plenty of room on this end. If the people squeeze together down on my end want to scoot over, we can scoot the chairs over so no one else falls uh, getting out. Um. Okay, sorry, I, don't, I had my presentation up here, but it I apologize. Um, I had this set up earlier. I also had a video clip up here. Do you need us? We could switch. Do you need a second? Huh? We could switch if you need a second. Uh, okay, sure. Why don't you go ahead and go? Why don't we you move to the next presentation so we can switch? Okay. Um, so we will skip forward in the program by one person. So that would be um, our next speaker would be Lillian. Paola, someone uh, who doesn't have PowerPoint. Ovalle. Don't have PowerPoint. Don't have PowerPoint. Excellent. All right. Uh, our next speaker, Mr. Gibalto Rosas, is an assistant professor of anthropology and Latina Latino studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He holds a doctorate and master's in anthropology from the University of Texas. He's held several prestigious fellowships most recently at the University of Chicago Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. His monograph, Berrio Libre, The Birth of Delinquent Sovereigns in the New Frontier, is under contract with Duke University Press, and we look forward to that book. His paper is titled, Insecuring Migrant Lives and Thickening Delinquency at the New Frontier. Dr. Rosas. Th thank you. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. I, I really want to uh, thank Alex for the invitation the hospitality of Emory, for the warm welcome, uh, uh, well, the hospitality of Emory and the other uh, participating institutions. It's been a, a really, uh, a I spent the past day and a half trying to figure out what will my work tell lawyers and policymakers that they can take into account. That's been my, my grappling with over the past day and a half. And I, I want to say that one, way, one thing it does do is captures the gaps between the law as written and the conditions on the ground. Specifically, how new regimes of policing prove to be in perverse proximity to criminality and delinquency at, at the border. Thank you. One of my founding premises of my work is that one cannot understand the intensifying drug trade, nor the ongoing drug, drug war, the consolidation of criminal networks, without un underscoring the vast flows of commodities, goods, and people, illicit and illicit alike, across the international boundary between the United States and Mexico that has been facilitated by the North American Free Trade Agreement. Now, as Dr. Campbell said this morning, anthropologists tend to work against criminalizing discourses of the state, and I do just that in my, in my work. <clears throat> I am a scholar of the birth of delinquency. My ethnography is on a group of youth in Nogales, Sonora, Mexico, who were criminalized and beca began to engage in criminal practices, including the mugging of migrants and consumption of street drugs. 
eventually many of them do become players as adults in the, in the drug industry. The paper that I'm, I'm about to give is composed of multiple excerpts from a 30-page chapter, so it's a bit fragmented, so please bear with me. Now to the everyday lives of improvised youth. In el barrio, uno ando en la calle, sin hacer nada, porque en la, en la escuela no nos quieren, y tampoco las fábricas, porque somos cholos. Y allí se van acercando esos vatos, los que venden drogas, y control el punto. In the barrio, we're on the streets, doing nothing, because schools don't want us, nor, nor the jobs, because we're cholos. And that's, do, and that's how those that sell drugs and control the distribution get close to us. Cholos, shorthand in Spanish for gangbangers, loom large in the United States and Mexico at the opening of the 21st century. But the specter is not revolution, but dark criminal menace. Cholos and cholas speak to criminal desires and delinquent possibilities, to pathological urbanizing criminal youth, to migrations gone afoul, and to immigrant dreams turned dark nightmares as they collide with an encroaching border and immigration archipelago. With Latinos now being the foremost ethno-racial population held in the United States federal penitentiary, federal penitentiary, federal penitentiary system, cholos and, ch cholos and cholas conjure demonizations. They evoke sensibilities of insecurity. They bear signs of unauthorized, unsanctioned, and unchecked cultural and racial flows. Once limited to certain regions of the United States Southwest, and major cities such as Los Angeles and Chicago in the United States, cholos and the anxious, circulating imaginaries about them are now a transnational phenomenon. They reach Mexico City, New York, Puebla, Central America. Now typically borders and frontiers are imagined as sites where migrations are thwarted or held in check. But it's important to remember that Mexico and other adept nation states also develop and legitimate and enact certain exercises of power designed to exploit global economic opportunities. In this case, undocumented migrations and their remittances. Programs such as Tres Por Uno, where the federal government contributes additional funding to migrant remittances in local communities, and the government's lauding of migrants as heroes underlines the depths of migration as an economic and social fact in Mexico. And the Mexican state must secure their well-being. The poli various police forces, the PFP, Grupo Beta, and the like, secure and cultivate the undocumented passage of profitable lives those who cross the border illegally. The concentration of Mexican police power at the border augments the aforementioned militarization of the border. The thousands of armed men and women of the, United, the U.S. nation state as militarized policing presence. The Border Patrol, the nation's largest police force, and its harnessing of military technology, technology and tactics at the border. Lure tactics of policing and military. Meanwhile, there's the DEA, the National Guard, and local police forces all at the border. And it should be noted, that these police forces and such, such policing practices were occurring well before September 11th, 2001. Scholars have argued that despite these vast regimes of policing that have occurred at the border, vast undocumented border crossings have occurred. In circumventing such militarized policings, 
undocumented migrants become subject to a whole range of criminal pra practices, including the Minutemen and other vigilante groups. They also are channeled into the neoliberal ovens of the killing deserts, where more than 5,000 corpses and many others and then the other remains have been found. Now let me turn to this, to, uh, to an next, well, to uh, an interview with, with, with a young man called Weddle. The police, talking about Grupo Beta, he's in Nogales, Sonora, Mexico, started, started asking us for credentials to work on the streets. We never needed them before. Other young people reported similar phenomena. Javi said, the authorities came and started to demand that, that los chorlos get credentials to wash windows. Before they used to panhandle or perform menial jobs on the, on the street in the tourist zone, relatively unencumbered. Suddenly, however, homeless, penniless and without credentials, they became the target of Mexican police forces. Gabriel, they came and chased us out of the tourist zone where we used to ask the gringos for money, gringos being US citizens, the tourists who crossed the border, and where we watched the windshields of cars going north. They were pushed out of this tourist zone and farther and farther south into Nogal, Sonora, Mexico, away from a very lucrative site where young people, impoverished, can make money. It is here that the term cholo suddenly becomes increasingly mapped upon, well, increasingly turned, well, let me, let me back up. It is here that the term cholo begins to increasingly refer to thugs, and then to insanitated and vulgar hybrids, as they began to prey upon the undocumented. And stories of police violence against this population escalated. Bolillo recounted to me, recounted to me a time when an officer from Grupo Beta arrested him. They painted me like a woman. They put on lipstick, eyeshadow, and put me in a dress. At this point in the interview, he stopped talking about this. But note, he was put into drag, sexually humiliated, and rendered vulnerable. Margarita recounts a similar story. One of the officers put his gun to my head and told me not to move. Negro, another youth, ran. The officer was going to hit me, and I told him, if you're going to hit me, don't hit me in my stomach because I'm pregnant. The officer then handcuffed me and took me to, my, to the office. There they told me that they were going to send me to the Correccional, the youth detention center. He asked me, if I send you there, will you stop? Will you stop being a chorla? I told him, maybe, I'll try. I'm already here, and there's nothing I can do about it. Her suggestion that she is already there, wow, really? Captures capture the density of police power in her and the other young people's lives at this moment in Nogal, Sonora, Mexico. I'm gonna skip ahead. So let me, let, me just, let me just jump to the conclusion, and it's very brief. This is to say that crime at the border, and I, I would imagine elsewhere in Mexico, cannot be simply taken as an objective reality. It is produced. In the, in the jagged moments following the, the implementation of NAFTA, and in, increased militarized forms of policing. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, we will uh, turn once again to uh, Professor Dorsey, and I've previously introduced her, but we'll, we'll proceed with her presentation at, at this time. Thank you. Okay. So uh, as, as my colleagues have discussed, um, a part of the uh, increased militarization of the border um, or the, the dialogue of violence involves increased militarization by both the Mexican government and the U.S. government in both Mexico and in the United States. And Miguel and I and I in our work are focusing on the United States side and what we're doing is we're applying metaphors that scholars have applied to Mexico, uh, the Mexican area, as a zone of necro power, uh, a necro state and necro citizenship, a place that's made a deathscape. And that's what we're arguing in our work is that the US government is making the border zone a deathscape. It's turning a place that were binational communities where people lived, green spaces, places that environmentalist birders came down to visit, beautiful tourist places, bulldozed and turned into brown, ugly moonscapes and deathscapes. But today what I want to focus on is um, the, one of the elements of the recent construction of the border wall in South Texas, and I want to draw your attention to two impacts, two social impacts. One, for people who live on the border, the border has effectively moved north. Where I live, the border is not where the port of entry is. And for, for many people, it's now two miles north. And as Miguel indicated, it's created a no man's land. So one impact is that the border has moved north. And the second is the idea of this exercise of necro power that has become an area, a zone of exclusion and death. So a few basic ideas to remember when you think about the border where we're doing our research is one, old towns, People lived in Granjeno starting in 1767. I don't know what happened to my slide, but you get the idea. Um, the border crossed them. They didn't cross the border. The border here is a river. It's not a desert. People were rabidly opposed to the construction of the border wall in these communities. Approximately 90% of the residents of South Texas, um, it doesn't matter what people's first language what is, what their ethnic identification is, what their political ideology is, everyone against the border wall. Guess what? It was still built. Here's the construction of the border wall, as Miguel indicated, 18-foot um, drop behind people's homes, and yes, children have fallen off and been hurt. Okay, in my talk, I'm going to focus on the impacts of the border wall construction in the border town of Hidalgo. Okay. As you can see here, here is the border, okay? Here is Hidalgo High School. This is the, the, the place that I'm gonna talk about specifically in this talk. And here is where the border wall was built. And here is the no man's land, as people call it, right? Residents can no longer go here. Okay, now I'm going to read for a second. On April 28, 2008, Colorado Congressman Thomas Tancredo attended a congressional hearing hosted by the University of Texas Brownsville and Texas Southmost College. At this meeting, U.S. Congressional Representative Tancredo addressed Brownsville landowners, environmental activists, and other concerned citizens disturbed by the government's seizure of property and the construction of the border wall. The presentations made to the congressman were well thought out. For a while, the congressman responded to citizen statements against the border wall construction with a series of counter arguments, but only at the end of the hearing. That's when Tancredo became exasperated and pointed out that too many people, and this is Tancredo, too many people in this area do not think that borders matter. He criticized the audience, quote, multiculturalist attitude, and stated in a matter of fact manner, quote, if you do not want a fence between you and Mexico, 
we suggest that you build the, the fence around the northern part of your city. So we told US residents in their hometown that the government might as well just build the wall north of their town and put them back in Mexico. The English language media in the border area responded in a restrained manner. For example, oh, I didn't mention, um, this research is in South Texas, so Brownsville, Cameron County, Hidalgo County, this is the southeasternmost portion of the border. So um, visualize where the Gulf of Mexico, Texas, and Mexico meet. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. The English language media in the border area responded in a restrained manner. For example, the Channel 5 anchor explained, perhaps with a touch of irony, that the Congress seemed to be, and here I quote, implying that Brownsville should be on the Mexican side of the wall. He says implying. He noted that Channel 5 was still seeking clarification from the congressman's office. Most news networks, including the regional English language newspaper, The Monitor, reported the congressman's statement without commentary. In our interviews, Valley residents talk about the congressman's statements, not so much with anger, but with bewilderment. It is probably obvious to most of us here today that the, Valley, the attitudes of South Texas residents to the border wall are much more complex, complex than what Tancredo says, quote unquote, not caring about the border or being multiculturalist. Um, as he implies by wanting to make Brownsville on the south side of the wall being anti-United States. It is true that many in South Texas are against the border wall. The question then becomes, and we think that this question is more complicated than it appears, how should we understand this opposition to the border wall? Allow us to describe the results of a random telephone survey that we just completed, or we completed last year. Okay, maybe the tech guy can help me with this. I don't know um, in terms of how to get this on, on there better, but this says border wall support. Um, <clears throat> Our survey of 153 residents of Hidalgo County showed that 60% of our respondents were against the border wall, 16% favored the wall's construction, and 24% were neither opposed nor supported the wall. For those who opposed the wall, the reasons given are, one, it costs too much, two, it will harm the environment, and many people when they said it costs too much, they also said the resources could be better used, three, it will damage relations with Mexico. And for those who support the wall, they gave reasons such as it will help stop terrorists and it will reduce illegal immigration. <clears throat> when asked about support, let's see. When asked about support for virtual fencing, 45%, up from 16% for the wall, favor virtual fencing, including more video cameras, lights, and sensors along the border and 37% thought that the number of Border Patrol agents in the area should be increased, and only 9% thought that the number should be decreased. These numbers show that the attitudes of residents towards, towards the wall cannot be reduced to a lack of concern about border security. These numbers show, um, if anything, opposition to the border wall does not necessarily mean opposition to the presence of Border Patrol or fencing. Such data makes us wonder then, what does it mean that Tancredo, in the face of opposition, characterized the Brownsville, mainly Mexican-American public, as irrational, multicultural, and pro-Mexican slash open borders, and then offered to build a wall around the northern part of the city? We suggest that the impacts of the border wall are deep and fall along two lines. One, the border has moved north and it functions to exclude citizens. And two, the borders become a site for the exercise of necro power. How is the border wall moved north? Okay, we go to the example of Hidalgo. Hidalgo High School, as you can see up there, their, their, their football field, which of course Texas is very famous for, their love of football. Um, all across the valley, but Hidalgo is a poor community. They rallied and built these incredible hike and bike trails and created a world birding center all along their levees. Um, so the track team from Hidalgo High School would run along the levees. Teachers would walk along the levees. Families would go out for evening strolls. Everyone trying to get healthier these days. Well, guess what? They can't anymore. Or if they do, what happens? The Border Patrol asked them for ID, right? 
People in their own town can't go walk for an evening stroll without having identification on hand. Okay. So for these people, what do they do? Well, they stop going for evening strolls on the levees that they help build with their money, but they, mo they walk for the northern parts of their city that are north of the wall. Okay. So what I'd like to do is, um, uh, in talking about the second point, that it's become a site for the exercise of necropower and exclusion, I want to use a, a, a video clip from a woman we spoke with, and I really don't want this recorded for posterity um, because this is, um, uh, okay. And what I, the reason why I want to show you a video clip is I want you to see the fear. This woman is a school teacher. She's from this town. She's not an immigrant, okay? This is her hometown. She stayed there, she's teaching. She's telling about how she used to go for these walks on the levee, and every time she's gone, just to look at the border wall, she's been harassed by the border patrol. This is a small town, right? Everyone knows everyone. The video clip, because when this woman speaks, you see her fear. I don't know if any of you have ever had an, an encounters with law enforcement officers, but they can often be very scary and change your entire life. So I want you to just to hear what she's saying about this experience. Let's see. In the middle of the left. And that's when she came over to me and, and told me. Was she in a car? Or, uh, she was on a super van. Okay. Yeah. And then I said, oh, okay, well, I would just wanted to come see this, you know. Uh, uh, and she said, well, be really careful. And she told me to, to move along as quickly as I could. So I just, and she left, and I was there, and I just took a you know, for like a second or two, and then I left. Did you take any pictures or anything? No, because I was scared. <laughs> no, because I was scared that I was going to do something that, you know, it wasn't that uh, bad. Yeah, that might get you in trouble. Yeah. Did you go back after that experience? No. No, I didn't go back. <laughs> so it kind of worked to scare you off, in a way? It kind of did, yes. It kind of did. Yeah. Okay, I have gone before at night uh, mm -hmm. with my dad because we were just talking about it and we just say, you know, let's go check it out. We check it out and, you know, talk about it and, you know, we said to her, it's not going to. So, um, in other words, for Tancredo, the border wall is not simply about a disruption of mobilities, but it is also about the enabling of specific constructions of publics and modes of power. That is, who can go in these areas? Who feels safe going in these areas? And who feels empowered to? Well, where we're doing our research, it's no longer the citizens of these communities who used to felt, feel just fine going in these areas. Tancredo's generalizations directed specifically to participants in Brownsville and indeed about residents of the region in general, including their opposition to the border wall, raised issues about border culture on many levels, but due to time I focus on one, necro power, the impending and relentless drive by the state to establish the border as a war zone. And here today I heard a presenter say, well, some of these are just border issues, they're mere border issues, and we can talk about how important they are once they reach the rest of the country. For some of us, these aren't mere border issues. Um, 
So for Tancredo, and he's clear about this, the borders, border is a border zone, which came out very clearly in Miguel's uh, presentation. With the construction of the, of the border wall, DHS is now enacting a strategy of diverting migrant traffic to more deserted areas. And as Huberto said, over 5,000 people have died. And, and human rights activist argues that these are a direct consequence of federal policy. State creation of such deathscapes is a hallmark of necro power, to borrow from Mbembe. In these deathscapes, states establish sovereign power for the purpose of surveillance and exclusion. In these zones of necro power, security forces, death and exclusion become normalized, part of everyday existence. Imagine the woman who you just heard speaking standing on the levee. This is a scenario we would argue that those who oppose the border wall are attempting to avoid. In conclusion, ultimately the future directions that border policies take will depend in part upon the ability of social actors to have their voices heard and for true dialogue to occur between border residents and national level policy makers. Clearly, one cannot reduce resistance to the border wall to a lack of respect for security or a multiculturalist attitude. This opposition to the border wall goes beyond the practicalities of criticizing the border wall because it costs too much or will not work. Again, this is not an issue of pragmatics. We would suggest that opposition to the border wall is a much deeper affair. To put the matter bluntly, this opposition is about the future of South Texas and in a way, border regions everywhere. It is about the relationship of democracy and security. It is about the construction of citizens within a democracy. Ultimately, it is about pre preventing South Texas from becoming a war zone, a full-fledged site of necro-citizenship. Thank you. And I'd like to close uh, with this final slide, which, because of the lighting, I know these things are hard to read. But this uh, is from the high school where we, we conducted this field work and spoke to people. And they, um, they are a college prep high school, and the sign on their door says citizenship caring enough to speak up for the good of your school and your community. And that's what they tried to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to make one, one other slight change in the program. Um, I'd like for Jenny to go next uh, because she does not have a PowerPoint and that might give Lillian an opportunity who will follow her. Perhaps you could get yours set up in the meantime, but I'll go ahead and uh, give you an introduction for my colleagues sitting to the left. Jenny Karubian is pursuing a PhD in women's studies here at Emory with a disciplinary concentration in anthropology. Her research focuses upon artistic forms of resistance against femicide in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. Jenny's interdisciplinary project integrates her training in feminist art, history, anthropology, uh, Marxist and critical theory to examine the movement uh, against femicide through an ethnographic lens. Originally from Los Angeles, Jenny holds a BA in women's studies from the University of California at Los Angeles and an MA in anthropology from the New School for Social Research. Her presentation is titled Femicide Under the Eclipse of Narco Conflict in Ciudad Juarez, Examining the Relationship Between Gender Violence and the Question of the Failed State. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Okay, um, I'm gonna just go ahead and read this paper so that I can make sure to get all of the details in, but thank you for the introduction. Since 1993, nearly a thousand women have been murdered in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. Some of the victims' bodies in exhibited evidence of sexual violence, mutilation, and torture, which has earned this border region international repute as a center of human rights violations against women. Scholars within and outside of Mexico, foreign governments, the United Nations, and international human rights agencies officially recognize what some term femicide and collectively demand the Mexican state eradicate this violence. Since 2008, the drug-related conflict in Juarez has shifted attention away from gender violence. Over 7,000 people have been murdered in the past three years, including journalists, police, public officials, professors, and innocent bystanders. The onslaught of violence that is currently claiming an average of 10 murders a day in Juarez has garnered international attention and called into question the viability of the Mexican state and rule of law. Although the press acknowledges the history of gender-based violence in Juarez, 
It represents this rash of drug violence as a separate and unconnected incident. However, what popular accounts overlook is the shifting relationship between violence and state power in the past two decades. This paper argues that these events must be compared historically in order to elucidate how violence in Juarez solidified state authority but later undermined state power. The guiding inquiry of this analysis is influenced by anthropological and sociological theories that examine the ontology of the state. A variety of scholars working within this tradition contend that the state is not an entity in and of itself. Rather, the state is accorded legitimacy and maintains coherence through a number of processes, performances, codifications between domains, and shrouding of social inequalities. In Notes on the Difficulty of Studying the State, Philip Abrams deconstructs the notion of the state itself. He maintains, quite provocatively, the state is not a thing. It does not as such exist. Abrams' concern is not the utility of government or bureaucratic apparatuses, but the ideological, the ideological power of the state. Abrams draws a distinction between what he calls the state idea and the state system. The state system is comprised of a number of practices and institutions, such as courts, state agencies, law enforcement, etc. while the state idea is an ideological force that is the mask of political practice. The recent outbreak of violence in Juarez has undermined the ideological force of the state idea. Failure of rule of law, extreme violence, and public responses to this crisis exemplify a loss of faith in the state. As such, I question why, in comparison to the current conflict, did 15 years of gender-based violence not undermine state legitimacy? While a simplistic response to this question is simply to point to the difference in scale. Yes, now there are a lot more murders, there's a lot more violence in comparison to the previous era when it was maybe three or four murders a month. But I do believe that that's not quite a complicated view. And um, so in this analysis, I'm going to uh, theorize the relationship between gender-based violence and state authority to look for some deeper meaning in the relationship between violence and uh, state legitimacy. In comparison to current public discourses that question the viability of the Mexican state, in the era of gender-based violence, blurred separations between organized crime and state agents, such as police, strengthen the ideology of the state. This is evidenced by the ways in which scholars, grassroots activists, and international human rights organizations continually attempted to pressure the Mexican state to end violence against women in Juarez. Rather than taking into account the pervasiveness of organized crime, the drug trade, and other violent actors in the border region, all of the major international interventions focused upon structural changes that could be made at the state level. These suggestions did not address eradicating organized crime and implicitly suggested that the crimes against women were unassociated with organized crime. The current crisis of rule in the border regions suggests that these approaches vested an unfounded level of faith in the ability of the state to end violence in Juarez. As drug-related violence continues to escalate and claim innocent lives on a daily basis, it is evident that the Mexican state is unable to control the use of, violence, of violent force against the populace. Because military failure to end the narcotics-related violence at the border has increased these murders and entailed a loss of control, it is unlikely that Mexican authorities were capable of eradicating violence against women during the years prior to the recent outbreak of violence. In considering this conundrum, it is necessary to question how the breakdown of rule of law in regards to violence against women strengthened the ideology of the state. In order to examine this question, I draw upon anthropological and sociological theories that maintain that the ideological force of the state requires three separate delineations. These are public versus private, rulers and ruled, and state and civil society. 
this wisdom holds that in order for the state to maintain its legitimacy. It has to draw these boundaries, even if sometimes they're very permeable or false in some cases. These boundaries are absolutely necessary to maintain rule. Um, from this perspective, divisions among authorities and competition for power between organized crime and state officials must be hidden from view in order to perpetuate the ideology of the state. Once the outbreak of drug-related violence disallowed the fictions of these, dis of these divisions to persist, the ideology of the state broke down and exposed the barriers of rule of law in Juarez. Because state legitimacy requires sharp delineations between domains, various agents maintain social divisions through state rituals that continually reinforce authority and separations between the state and civil society. In Juarez, ritual violence against women was central to constructing dichotomies of this nature. Women consistently disappeared, were infrequently found in desolate spaces outside the city, such as in the desert, and it was unknown when the killers would strike again. Through discursive and violent tactics, authorities relegated femicide to the private sphere. Their narratives constructed an image of violence that lurked in the shadows, awaiting women who dare to transgress the domestic realm. This fostered a culture of terror that was buttressed by continual disappearances and murders that persisted for 15 years. Discursive tactics enabled the state to superimpose its internal crisis onto the population. Reconfigurations of sovereignty, internal divisions, and conflicts with organized crime undermined state authority. Public outrage against femicide and its continual relegation to the private sphere allowed the state to conceal its inner divisions and ongoing collusions and clashes with the drug cartels. This complex interweaving between public and private created a discursive spectacle that called attention away from the ills that plagued the state structure. As more women were murdered and public response heightened, the state reinforced its authority. Although in recent years, state failure to obscure the disagreements between state level authorities and organized crime resulted in a breakdown of the local state. For over a decade, femicide or increased or widespread violence against women allowed this mirage of social divisions to persist. The separation between the police and organized crime was exceedingly unclear during this era. Despite investigations by international agencies, recognition by foreign governments, and a thriving social movement against femicides is irrelevant when considered within the context of the current conflict. Police inadequacy and state apathy toward violence against women dichotomized the subaltern populace and dominating elites. Through this division, the state authorized its power and differentiated itself from civil society. Whether police or unaffiliated criminals perpetuate this violence is, in, is insignificant, for the effect is the same. By allowing the divisions between elites, and by elites I mean organized crime, state officials, police, any kind of agents of power that the divisions between them were very unclear, um, all of the organized crime in the city became blamed on the state for a very long time. Many documentaries were filmed that claimed that, oh, it's the police doing it, things like that, that didn't, that completely shrouded the pervasiveness of organized crime in the, in the city. Now systematic, now since 2008, the systematic, per, um, systematic murders of police officers, police chiefs by drug cartels suggest that the police were never in a position of authority to eradicate femicide. Although they, it was blamed on them, it doesn't make sense at this point, why would drug cartels murder the police if the police were in cahoots, so to speak, with the drug cartels? So the recent kind of outbreak of violence really negates a lot of the theories that pervaded um, the murders at that time. But rather than revealing their inadequacy and powerlessness against criminals, the police engaged in tactics that concealed their relationship with organized crime. Although conf conflicts between these dominant forces have since come into view and ultimately dismantled the structure of the local state, this previous configuration allowed elite powers to coexist under one rubric and dominate the population through the threat of violence. Continual disappearances of women, police inadequacy, death threats to victims' families, and the overall longevity of this violence 
solidified state authority in the midst of social, political, and economic transformations that were transpiring in the wake of NAFTA. Femicide lurked in the shadows, evoked fear among the populace, and disguised divisions among authorities. The public nature of violence associated with the current crisis lays bare these divisions between ruling powers. Whereas in the past, these contours were invisible or unknown, divergences between ruling classes are part and parcel of the ensuing spectacle of violence. The continuum of femicide and drug-related violence in Sierra Juarez reveals that when violence was hidden, it solidified state power, while its sudden movement into the public realm destabilized the state. At the heart of both instances are social divisions, public-private, rulers and ruled, state and civil society, upon which the ideological power of the state is founded. The outbreak of femicide was crucial to state power at a moment in which the ideological force of the state was in crisis. Gender-based violence enabled the state to shroud its internal divisions, confuse separations between legitimate and illegitimate powers, and reinforce a public-private dichotomy upon which the state constructed its authority. Thank you. Thank you very much. And while our next speaker is uh, moving into position to prepare her PowerPoint, um, let me introduce Lillian Paula Ovalle. She is a research professor at the Cultural Research Center of the Autonomous University of Baja, California. She holds a master's in social sciences at the UABC Mexico and in psychology by the Pontifica Universidad Javeriana in Colombia. She has specialized in the study of socio-cultural processes related to drug use and drug trafficking, and she is the author of two books whose titles you will see in her uh, more full biography in the program. So we'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Bueno, voy a hablar en español. La presentación que traigo se titula Imágenes abyectas en visibilidad de las víctimas. Es una idea muy sencilla, es simplemente esta idea de la que voy a tratar de argumentar aquí, que es cómo en las narrativas visuales de la violencia en México, lo, lo que aparece allí invisible son las víctimas. Entonces, <coughs> bueno, ¿qué es, lo, ¿qué es lo abyecto? Las imágenes eh, que narran la violencia actual en el territorio mexicano se caracterizan por lo abyecto, Esto hace referencia a algo que sea repugnante, que sea perturbador. Eh, los, los objetos abyectos son aquellos que horrorizan, pero sobre todo que alteran la, la identidad y que trastornan, que trastornan el orden y que trascienden de los límites del sentido. Y eso es lo que voy a tratar de trabajar aquí. Cómo en esta violencia inédita, por, lo, por la forma en que es teatralizada, el, los límites del sentido que se le puede dar a, esta, a, a estas formas de utilizar el cuerpo después de asesinado, después de muerto, eh, care, que hacen que por, también por la velocidad en la que suceden estos hechos violentos, el sentido de, de lo humano se ve allí trastocado. Entonces, bueno, eh, estas imágenes abyectas por lo general, obviamente, eh, hieren las susceptibilidades, mirarlas es difícil, Para mí ha sido muy difícil estar mirando estas imágenes, tratar de hacer un análisis de estas narrativas que se están construyendo a partir de las imágenes y presentarlas o exponerlas también es difícil. Por eso eh, quisiera pedirles que voy a tratar, o sea, voy a utilizar pocas imágenes porque creo que mis argumentos las necesitan para que queden claros y que la idea es que me ayuden a que si ustedes no se derrumban, yo no me derrumbo y, y puedo terminar la ponencia. Y pues también que, que entiendan cuál es el sentido de, de mostrar esas imágenes y de exponerlas en un, en un espacio como este académico, eh, que finalmente, como les digo, no creo que mi, mis argumentos puedan verse claros si no las presento. Entonces, ok. Eh, lo que planteo aquí es que en la técnica del asesinato se expresa una cosmovisión y que lo que estamos viendo en estas narrativas visuales no, son, no es solamente… No es solamente una técnica del asesinato, sino eh, que estas muertes y esta teatralización de la violencia nos muestra cómo lo más importante aquí no es solamente asesinar, sino que el objetivo trasciende el mismo hecho de la muerte. Eh, bueno, lo primer, 
voy a trabajar cuatro ideas básicas. La primera es la, la, el vacío conceptual en cuanto a la retórica de la guerra, lo inadecuado que es, que es entender estas muertes con esta noción de guerra, por eh, dos, caracter, dos, es, dos elementos fundamentales. El primero es porque en la, en la misma noción de guerra implica la, la posibilidad de ubicar un enemigo externo, un enemigo eh, que, sea, pues sí, que sea externo a la sociedad sobre el cual se va, se va a generar esta violencia y esta es la principal falacia en la guerra contra el narcotráfico o contra el tráfico de las drogas, porque ese enemigo no es externo, sino hace parte de la sociedad. Los traficantes son, son nuestros vecinos, son nuestros estudiantes, son los hijos de la vecina o son, los, son el primo, entonces en este sentido es como el primer elemento en el cual considero que esta lógica de guerra eh, es totalmente inadecuada para poder encontrar el sentido de lo que está sucediendo y la violencia actual en México. La, el otro elemento que planteo aquí es, la, es el desequilibrio en, las, en, la, en la escena de violencia, o sea, el conceptualmente la noción de guerra implica eh, la posibilidad de establecer claramente, o sea, que primero cuáles serían los, los tres actores, que sería víctima, los victimarios y los testigos, que haya un cierto consenso en, en identificar esto y además implica la, un equilibrio de fuerzas, no implica ejercer la fuerza frente, a, frente al inerme, sino implica una guerra entre por lo menos eh, actores arma, igualmente armados. Para presentar como este desequilibrio de, en, en estas escenas, quisiera presentarles un pequeño video, que son estos videos que se suben diariamente en la red, bueno, los diariamente los suben y diariamente los vuelven a bajar, pero que hace parte de esta práctica de, de subir. ¿Hace cuánto tiempo llegaste a Tampico? Hace 15 días. ¿Qué venía a hacer a Tampico? Calentarle la plaza a los del cártel del Golfo. ¿Quién es su mano inmediato? La comandante güera Liliana, o alias la Puma. ¿Quién fue la que, quien, quien planeó todos los ataques a Tampico? La comandante güera Liliana, alias la Puma. ¿Qué fue lo que hicieron en Tampico? Se tiraron unas granadas en el antro o centro nocturno de, de Tampico. Se balancearon unas personas civiles, se tiraron granadas también en el cuartel general de, de soldados. ¿Qué más se había planeado hacer? Balancearon los taxistas halcones, los demás grameros. ¿Qué más se habían planeado hacer en Tampico? Quedarse con la plaza para atacar de adentro hacia afuera, señor. Atacar de adentro hacia afuera de la sí. plaza, posesionarse de la plaza. Así es. ¿Quién iba a estar al mando de todo el operativo? La Siempre. Güera Liliana. ¿Tú qué función tenías en el operativo? Tenía el cargo de unos grupos que mandaron de Villahermosa, del comandante Charpey. ¿Cuántos elementos traías? Diez. ¿Cuántos? Diez. ¿Cuántos elementos había en Tampico? de grupo operativo que traía la comandante Güera? Aproximadamente 30. ¿30 elementos? Sí. Bueno, al final de estos ocho minutos de interrogatorio, eh, el video muestra cómo, cómo es ejecutado y luego este, este cuerpo fue abandonado en las, en, afuera en las oficinas de Televisa, de, bueno, de una de un medio de comunicación y, y obviamente también fue transmediático la, esta, esta muerte como una muerte más sin, sin rostro. Entonces, como vemos en esta escena, está totalmente desequilibrada y las antiguas categorías pues, resultan insuficientes, no se sabe allí quién es la víctima ni quién es el victimario, no se sabe quién es el que está el, el haciendo el interrogatorio, si es un militar, si es una persona miembro de, de, miembro de otro grupo. Eh, entonces, eso es básicamente lo que quería plantear sobre este vacío conceptual y la necesidad de establecer es nuevas categorías que por, permitan entender este tipo de violencia. Bueno, en la otra idea que quiero plantear aquí es hacer referencia a los rituales 
ritual, formas ritualizadas de asesinato y de sobre todo el, del manejo del cuerpo una vez eh, han sido asesinados y la naturalización de estas formas. Se empiezan a hablar en, en los medios de comunicación de categorías, eh, bueno, se hablan de tiro de gracia, balaceras, encuajuelados, encobijados, enteifados, empozolados, zarandeados, mutilados, decapitados, que todas son formas eh, que, que, que hacen referencia a formas diferentes de utilizar el cuerpo y teatralizarlo, dejarlo en, el espacio, en vías del espacio público de formas diferentes. Eh, por ejemplo, los encajuelados pues, hacen referencia a cuerpos que son dejados dentro de cajuelas, generalmente en bolsas de plástico. Los encobijados pues, son dejados en el espacio público en cobijas. Los enteipados hacen referencia a, esta, a una forma también muy repetitiva en estos rituales de muerte que está relacionada con eh, poner como cinta plateada alrededor del rostro y en, y en las muñecas. Los empozolados eh, son cuerpos que son desechos en ácido, los arandeados son eh, quemados, incinerados, o incinerados y bueno, y mutilados y decapitados son los que, que la, más, que to, más que la forma, es la forma en que se, en que se escenifica en el espacio público y cómo se, eh, se, se, se organiza toda la escena para que sea vista y para que sea, sea expresada de una forma transmediática. Bueno, perdón. Bueno, en la anterior, veamos la, la, esa diapositiva ponía las la letras en cursiva porque lo que consideraba, lo, lo importante aquí es ver cómo todas estas categorías conceptuales de los encobijados, los enteipados y todo esto, finalmente lo que hacen son, eh, son neologismos que trivializan estas muertes y que cuando se vuelven categorías eh, que se habla, de, se utiliza y también se denominan de esta manera en los medios de comunicación, eh, es una forma más que promueve esta naturalización de estas muertes y de invisibilizar a las víctimas. Cuando, cuando se hablan con estas categorías, no, o sea, la víctima allí no, no es visible, simplemente es un encajuelado más o un enteipado más. Entonces, como la, la importancia de ver que la forma como nombramos a, a, a estos sujetos, a estos cadáveres de personas, tiene, tiene una consecuencia. Y en este caso la consecuencia es esa trivialización, banalización, eh, de estas muertes. Okay, entonces, bueno, esa sería la, la segunda idea que quería trabajar, que habla sobre la importancia, bueno, sobre el rostro, Perdona, sobre el rostro y eh, la unicidad, la unicidad del cuerpo. Entonces, lo que quiero plantear es cómo este tipo de violencia, eh, digamos, borra el rostro. En las imágenes anteriores que vimos que eran los, los enteipados, eh, vemos cómo están estos rostros tapados. Y eh, la pregunta que surge allí es, ¿qué se puede, ¿cómo se puede plantear una narrativa visual en la cual los, los rostros son borrados? Y no son solamente borrados por el victimario, sino también tanto por los medios de comunicación, por el lenguaje, que también en, de esta forma abstracta se borran los rostros de las víctimas. Bueno, eh, esto habla sobre la unicidad del cuerpo, cómo está como este tipo de violencia eh, es un tipo, o sea, se, se, la forma en que utilizan el cuerpo y otra vez cómo lo teatralizan, cómo lo muestran, eh, tiene un mayor impacto tanto en los familiares como a nivel social. Es una forma de terrorismo, es una forma de construir el miedo social que eh, hace que sea mucho más difícil que se piense sobre esto, que se reflexione, que se aborde académicamente. Que, y sobre todo como que, 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 la, que, la, que surjan iniciativas ciudadanas que puedan, digamos, tener una voz de decir no más a la violencia o no más. Ok, eh, estas, imágenes, estas imágenes de los decapitados eh, son una forma también que, que se está repitiendo por diferentes partes del territorio mexicano y eh, que, que implica una forma en la cual el sentido del humano se, se derrumba mucho más precisamente por, lo, por, la, por la forma en que combina tanto, la un, tanto el romper, el desquebrajar la unicidad del cuerpo, como mostrar el rostro, que es la parte más, de, más importante, digamos, en la geografía humana, donde está la cepa de nuestra identidad. Y bueno, eh, lo que se plantea finalmente es la, la necesidad de 
restituir la identidad ontológica de, todas estas, de todos estos cuerpos. Esa era básicamente como la, la ponencia que les quería presentar hoy. Gracias. Thank you very much. And our final speaker is Rocío Magaña, a political anthropologist whose research on the social and political implications of the death and injury of Mexican migrants uh, on the border expands almost a decade. In 2008, she received her PhD from the University of Chicago. In 2011, she'll be at the University of Michigan as a visiting scholar, completing the manuscript for her book, Bodies on the Line, Death, Life, Death, and Authority on the Arizona-Mexico Border. She's currently an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at Rutgers, and her presentation is titled, The Body as Public Evidence, The Doing and Undoing of Violence and Authority at the Margins of the Mexican State. Thank you, um, and thanks to you for sticking throughout. Uh, you've listened to 20 different people, so I know I'm the 21st. La última y nos vamos. Este, uh, thank you, and thanks to Emory University, <laughs> to Alex Barney, to Mary Ward, um, and for the invitation. Much like Gilberto, I was also really excited about coming, mostly because of what you had to say, and then I had to confront what I had to say to you. So, um, so I also adapted a, a small piece of a paper, a 30-page paper, and this is the part that I thought would be relevant. So here it goes. And I am the kiss of death. I'm going to read it, too. But bear with me. Um, among the many controversial stories surrounding the recent celebrations of uh, Mexico's independence bicentennial, from the cost of the fireworks display to the sha -la 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 -las of the official song, um, a particular piece of news of a non-event deserves attention. At 11.30 p.m. on the night of September 15th, Mexico's Ministry of Interior, La Secretaría de Gobernación, issued a press release indicated, indicating that Mexicans had celebrated the anniversary of the birth of the nation in an environment of festivity, unity, and harmony, and more importantly, with zero casualties. <laughs> the press release, which was immediately disseminated by the country's major, major newspapers, stated in Spanish, Hasta este momento, el gobierno federal reporta saldo blanco en la jornada de este 15 de septiembre, donde no se registró mayor importancia de incidentes en las entidades del país. The saldo blanco, zero fatality um, pronouncement on the celebration was echoed by media outlets throughout the country. Here's a sample. Michoacán reporta saldo blanco en el festejo del, del Bicentenario, el Universal. Saldo blanco en celebraciones del Bicentenario en Jalisco, el Informador. Saldo blanco en los desfiles del Bicentenario en Guerrero, el Despertar del Sur. Saldo blanco, festejos del Bicentenario en Jalapa, la Jornada de, de Veracruz. Saldo blanco en Tijuana, luego de festejos de patrios del Bicentenario, uh, Unirradio Informa. Saldo blanco tras el Bicentenario en Oaxaca, Reflexión Informativa de Oaxaca. Saldo blanco en Coahuila tras festejos del Bicentenario. Saldo blanco durante el festejo del Bicentenario en Hermosillo, Azteca, uh, Sonora. Saldo blanco en los, en los festejos del Bicentenario en Mérida even in the northern state of Chihuahua and Ciudad Juarez, where uh, there were apparently no deaths. Festejan el grito más de 20,000 chihuahuenses con saldo blanco. And in Ciudad Juarez termina el desfile del Bicentenario con saldo blanco. And just to drive the point home, entre líneas, uh, Chihuahua proclaim saldo blanco en festejos del Bicentenario en todo el país. So, and I did try to look for a definition in English of saldo blanco, but I, I mean, and I ask throughout, and the, 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 the notion doesn't quite translate, which is quite interesting. So, um, so many ways to think about this unison voice uh, in the Mexican press. Should we say this festive unity, harmony that was manifested in the Saldo Blanco pronouncement? Uh, but I would like to bracket all of those potential criticisms and really focus on, on one thing, on the idea of the bodies that Saldo Blanco refers to indirectly here. Um, dead bodies, and in this case, the lack of dead bodies. In my larger work, I examine the politics, uh, uh, the, the political field surrounding the management of bodies, um, and how the handling of bodies of migrants that are alive is employed by various actors in the Arizona, Sonora region, uh, whether Mexican actors, American actors, governmental, non-governmental, um, and how it is that their bodies are used to sustain claims, uh, their 
claims of these actors to uh, authority, legitimacy, and the urgency of, of their actions on the border. We're getting romantic here. So there is much more that I could say about that, um, but I wanted to stay closer to the theme of the conference. So, uh, so I want to focus on this idea of saldo blancos, and I, because I see the reading of those headlines as um, another technocratic work behind them, as another instance in which, the politi in which political authority hinges on the image, real or referential, of the dead body in the Mexican national scene. So throughout the conference, there have been references to the training of crime scene investigators, as well as the relatively recent delineation of protocols pertaining the custody of material evidence. Uh, in the context of violence like the one Mexico is currently experiencing, bodies, the construction of evidence, and the con contestation of power over people and space are dangerously interwoven. So I would like to turn uh, to the bodies of the dead, uh, to their bodies as evidence, and to the truths that they are made to tell, and to how all of this fits within a cultural field of understanding for the Mexican national subject. Um, in this cultural field of understanding, extraordinary violence that becomes mundane has been, tied to social, has been tied to social and cultural cohesion and to national sovereignty as well. So our understanding of violence becomes a way of, of being part of the national uh, collective. That's part of the argument, anyhow. So my interest in the handling of migrant bodies in, there in Arizona and recently of narco assassinatos in Sonora and beyond has been to explore how the state paradoxically asserts its authority over people and territory at places, places and moments where its failure to protect would otherwise signal its limits of powers and, and the limits of its governmental apparatus. Um, for the purposes of time, I'm only gonna talk about um, the cultural field um, around a particular scene. Uh, and this is, this is a photograph that I actually received this summer. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just gonna move into that. So to put it bluntly, the significance of the dead body on the U.S.-Mexico border, it's in its political afterlife, so to speak. Long, but long before the stories of contemporary violence could contribute to the perception of this border as a site of mayhem, death, and the public displays of bodies, um, display of bodies, already defined state interventions and defied its pronouncements. And there's a long history of this. Take, for instance, a report that appeared in the New York Times in September 29, 1915, in the middle of the Mexican Revolution and the Texas Troubles. Um, this report tells the story of the kidnapping and the killing of a 21-year-old American private whose name was Richard Pryor by what they call at that moment border rebels. Um, so he was, he was kidnapped and killed and uh, his body was taken to the Mexican side of the border and they, quote, exhibited his head on a pole as a trophy on the Mexican side of the Rio Grande. And there is a long history of incidents like this in which the body becomes a the body, the, the body that as, as the, the target for violence and the border as a kind of limit of national space and jurisdiction uh, kind of overlap um, throughout this. Um, and it's not a matter of history as we've been talking about this th uh, today. And technology has made the spread of border related news and notas rojas and these images um, ever more, more prevalent. It's been relentless and, vir and viral. One day's um, worth of email on narco assassinatos proves this point and that's email that I received. So on July 2nd, 2010, this summer, the first round of emails to arrive to my inbox added three bodies to the tally of corpses left hanging from bridges. We've said enough about that. The second round of emails narrated an attack at four in the morning um, in which 25, 21 people were gunned down uh, with heavy artillery outside of the town of Tubutama, Sonora, on the historic Camino de las Misiones a little solitary desert road I used to use throughout my research. And, um, and it's really significant here because this is not a place, I mean, this was a place that was in the 80s. This road used to, the stories people say that used to be used by, by, uh, by uh, avionetas, by Cessnas. They would just land their planes on that road and then, you know, just do the crossing. But ever since then, it's a really pretty road. But um, it's been marked in different ways. I used to drive it all the time by myself. A few hours later, on July 2nd, this year as well, uh, El Diario de Sonora broke a, th a third story um, with two simple sentences in Spanish, or actually in English. A couple of severe heads were found at 5.30 this morning in Nogales, hanging from the fence of the Rosario Cemetery with an arco mensaje. Initial in inquiries indicate that the heads are those of two men. End of story. This last story merits attention not just because of the powerful object uh, quality of the scene, and I'm thankful that you described that, 
um, but also because of the complex role that severe heads have played in Mexican history and politics. More elaborate cov coverage on the events of that date followed, but, uh, but the initial report on this, two, on this last incident uh, deserves attention. The first one clarified the location of the crime scene in case people wanted to go check it out. The second one, in the second one, a user um, inquires casually in Spanish. Hello, does anyone have photos of this? The request is interesting for several reasons. Um, over the course of my research, I witnessed in awe how quickly organized crime developed in a capillary fashion throughout northern uh, Sonora, and how under the premise of excessive danger, people abandoned the streets, but congregated online vocifer vociferously. The promise of anonymity quickly turned in internet forums into active venues for exchange of information, gossip, insults, and the framing of rivals. The circulation and deconstruction of, ima of images is a strong component of this activity. In 2002, when I was beginning to do research on the border, I had a chance of, uh, to witness a similar kind of engagement um, on the ground in Reynosa. Every afternoon in a beauty parlor, uh, smugglers, stripper, uh, strippers, and a few other slightly deviant types, really interesting people, would gather around the newspaper to dissect its ima the, the images and the stories, uh, looking for information that might reveal compromised locales, uh, snitches, fallen bosses, and corrupt or corruptible officials. Years later, in Arizona, uh, I would see law enforcement engage in similar activities and partake in debates with reporters and editors over the ethics of publishing leaked images from often, often questionable uh, sources. But in the meantime, the ubiquity of uh, photograph taking gadgets, everyone has a phone that takes photos, everyone has a camera that takes photos, right, and video. Um, and the possibility of viral and, anom and anonymous posting and the escalation of violence throughout the, uh, the border region have made the internet a second stage where the dead can be displayed and they can also be made to work. Uh, thus, images from the cemetery were easily procured. Um, Mexican police took the one shared by me by, uh, that, that I got by, uh, by contacts. This photograph was also posted online. Um, the photograph shows a sort of, and I'm just gonna describe it, a sort of triptych display um, with a poster side scarboard um, sign at the center, flanked on either side by, by the head of a young man hanging upside down with wire against the background of the cemetery walls, which are marigold color, which is the color of the dead, interestingly. Um, the night before, uh, uh, July 2nd, Eric Hanse Urrea Cota and Gerardo Gonzalez Moss, 22 and 23 years old, were forcibly picked up from their homes by convoy vehicles. Um, as unwilling patrons of this sort of t uh, triptych, the heads completed the message of the handwritten insignia. Man up, this will happen to you. It may seem tempting to qualify this incident simply as part of the ongoing criminal campaign that exploits a dead body to terrorize the public, to intimidate the ranks of competing syndicates, um, and to undermine state forces. But the effects and messages here were more complex. Um, and let's take a look at some of the reactions on, on some of these forums. Uh, a self-identifying middle-class user by the name of Alejandra writes, it's a calamity that things in this country have fallen out of control in this way. How far will we go? And this is in Spanish, but I don't have the translation, sorry. Uh, and then a post by, no mas, por favor, celebrate it. This is great news, let them kill each other. Still, the expressions of concerns uh, or disregard like this ones were in the minority um, among, the, among those inquiring about the, the scene's context, the details, the significance. For example, Laura asked, could someone tell me what the narco mensaje says? And Amario inquire, who are these dudes? Another user, who put the signs up? And who, uh, who were they picking a fight with? Minutes, minutes later, um, after this last posting, someone reported, I responded with, uh, with quite a bit of information. I understand that these dudes work for the Beltran brothers and that they most li more likely were dispatched by Gijo or Yankee who controls the plaza and who works for Mayo and El Chapo. And the conversation goes on. Uh, somewhere else in a different forum, uh, Devil's Advocate added with sarcasm, lo bueno que se le está ganando la lucha al narco. And yet, I think that it is important not to disregard this whole thing with sarcasm. I think that a closer look at this particular photograph and how it was that it got to be circulated um, tells us a lot about how is it that violence is, is turned on its head in Mexico, at least to, to make the system somewhat sustainable. So, um, so a more complete description, uh, description of the photograph is in order. So you have the heads, you have the, tip, the triptych, and then um, on the first plane of the photograph, 
Uh, there is a member of Mexico's federal police standing stoically observant and anonymous with its back to the camera. Oh, very quickly, okay. The agents towers over four civilian onlookers who's, um, who look probably like migrants. And then from the, the only action that we see in the photograph comes from one of the sites in which we can see two latex gloves hands. Both of them are right arms and both of them are for males. And one of them is straddling the head while the other one is actively cutting the wire that is holding the, that is holding the head to the fence. So um, through the intervention of these hands, the um, let me actually, it is, it is not insignificant that in the scene marked by delivered gore, the arms of the forensic experts working with clean pre precision stand in for the state, as if the promise of procedural order were the antidote to the violent insecurity of, this criminal, of the criminal geographies that intersect on this border. Through the intervention of these hands, the criminal, the criminal triptych is to be undone, at least that is the message. The state is to, take, is to take possession of the remains, bringing the once dislocated uh, body under its juris jurisdictional hold. This is not just the, the image of the dead bodies, uh, criminally and violently displayed in public space, but rather a depiction of the state at work to assert its power over the uncertainty um, of lawlessness at its margins. So. Uh, just as important as the hands retrieving the heads is the labor of the invisible hands behind the camera and the anonymous sources that circulated these images electronic, electronically or feed other similar like this, other images like this to the media or who post them online as well, right? Um, as far as I know, our border agencies have strict por uh, protocols barring the photographing and documenting of crime, crime scenes for anything other than official investigative purposes. But images are constantly leaked to the press, posted online, and circulated among friends. Um, after a former forensic investigator had shown me pictures of migrant death cases, uh, he considered outstanding because the bodies had not just been simply found laying somewhere, but you know, they were more complicated. I confronted him about the protocols of using these images, and he responded, only investigators are authorized to photograph. All photographs constitute evidence. He responded quickly and authoritatively. So if anyone takes a photo, say, with their cell phone, that's evidence. And if they're caught with it, well, that looks bad. It's incriminating. But when I pressed about photos that we both had seen in extra official context, he replied with a smirk, well, everyone likes trophy shots. Typically, trophy shots capture extraordinary events, large drug busts, particularly a particularly uh, clever way to clam camouflage contraband, or a uh, or a particularly gory crime scene. Images um, are routinely sent to colleagues and peers part, uh, partly as information, partly as bragging rights, and partly for amusement or dismay. Moreover, um, the characterization of such images as trophy shots also suggests a, a narrative tropes of winners and losers, of hunters and kill. If the photograph taken at the cemetery could be considered a trophy shot, the ultimate hunter would not be the perpetrating cartel. I would like to argue that the ultimate hunter here would be the actors undoing the display, and we may want to read that as a state, but it gets complicated. So by way of contextualizing this appropriation of the dead body on display, I think it is necessary to start at the beginning, uh, and indulge me here for a second. At the beginning um, of stories of, of, Mexi of Mexicans of your heads, at the beginning of the, of the formation of Mexican subjects, at the beginning of Mexico as a nation state, and I think that they all coincide. Um, all Mexican children learn at a very early age that in the struggle for Mexican independence, Hidalgo and a group of insurgent leaders fell within a first year. As a deterrent to further uprisings, the colonial government beheaded, beheaded them, and then they, they hang the, you know, their heads on the, along the, uh, the Granaditas, and as, a, as an eight-year-old child, you learn that the heads were there on display for 10 years. According to school textbooks, the public display ended uh, once the War of Independence had, had, uh, had been won. And the newly independent government took down the heads, which are now buried under the El Angel de la Independencia, the, con the, the place where we all go celebrate our victories. So the goal here, so, uh, so I find rather interesting that the, the interventions on the body, uh, we learn as Mexican subjects, is intimately tied to, the, to Mexican sovereignty. They, they both coincide. And so the goal here is not to reduce a long, complex process of uh, national independence to the fate of foreheads, but rather to reflect on the role assigned to them in this national origin story and to the formation on, of national subjects. As Claudio Lomnitz has, um, has shown, the cultural perception of death as a nationalistic popular construction in Mexico does not precede the state, but rather it emerges and changes with it. 
If the execution of these insurgents was a way for the colonial government to punish them as individuals, their decapitation and public display was intended to control and punish the body politic, the collective nation, right? But still more important is the teaching that those events in which the termination of the public display of the head signals the, competition, the completion of Mexican sovereignty. So with this background in mind, I think that the image of expert hands maneuvering to undo the work of organized crime can be centrally contextualized within the repertoire of Mexican statecraft. Uh, the most robust, robust expression of the state power tend to take place at the margins because it is there where the state is the most fragile. And by margins, I don't only wanna mean territorial margins, but also legal margins and, and temporal margins, right? So, uh, uh, in the case of Mexico, the recent violence reveals the limitations of the state vis-a-vis -vis organizations that supersede its jurisdictional reach. But in light of that, claims to authority and, effective and its effectiveness pivot on the, on the subtle recasting of such violence. Um, so let me just finish with a couple of things, right? Certainly the management, the representation, and the actual infliction of death has, uh, has long been consider considered a cornerstone of, uh, of state sovereignty. Lots of political history on that. The point to take away here is that the semant semantic pol uh, potency, the symbolic potency of the, of the body as a stage in which the desirable or acceptable can be conveyed, uh, conveyed is precisely what makes interventions on the publicly dislocated or displaced dead body social politically productive. It, it's a place that is ripe for, for interventions. Um, this also helps to contextualize the zero casualty framework uh, for speaking of the Bicentennial, the Bicentennial allow, allowing perhaps to see that violence, even it, in its absence, remains uh, central to how Mexico sees or speaks of itself. <coughs> for as long as the terms of political authority and governmental success continue to be framed in terms of bo uh, body counts of, you know, saldos blancos, there is little comfort to be found in the proclamation of the temporally um, specific saldos blancos. And thank you. Thank you very much. We have um, a few minutes for questions or comments. If any of the speakers uh, sparked a thought that you would like to follow up on, you could either address it to one of the speakers or the panel as a whole. I know that uh, for myself, I, I found the images and particularly the border, but the word images, images, words, stories, something that in here in Atlanta, we don't have a daily experience with, with La Frontera. And so uh, very useful, I think, to contextualize uh, some of the larger uh, goals of the rule of law project here. Any questions or comments? Well, all of the speakers, my hope is that all of the speakers are available for the dinner this evening, if not also tomorrow. So please do follow up with them if you have a, a particular question and, and, and to hear more about their wonderful work. And in, in the meantime, though, if you would please join with me in thanking this group for all the presentations that we heard today. So I believe we're convened. I'm not sure your next instructions other than dinner, and I believe the program lists a location. So we hope you can uh, join us for that. <laughs>